All right, well then maybe I'll get started. Um, all right, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming and joining us. Um, some of you may be aware we've historically been kind of putting on webinars typically every month, just about some, usually about technology, whether it's an analyzer uh, technology or an application, or in some case, uh, a new product. And so uh, we kind of try to do this as a regular thing. We do have a YouTube channel, so all of these usually get recorded and end up on YouTube as well. So if you uh, do find it useful or interesting and wish one of your colleagues have been here, you'll get an email afterwards that'll uh, have a copy of all the slides and also we'll have a, a link to the recording. Um, I always usually try to start these off to, uh, saying that, you know, I'm used to being interrupted, three kids, and so used to be told I'm wrong as well. So if anybody has any comments or questions along the way, please feel free to jump in. Either turn on your mic and feel free to interrupt me, or you can toss a question up in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, as will Jaden, and, uh, and we'll try to address your question as soon as we can. Um, all right, with that, I'm going to get rolling here. So again, welcome. We're going to talk today about uh, ways of generating moisture calibration or validation standards. I'm going to try to really separate the subject of uh, calibration and validation, and you're going to see why as we go on. Um, but what we're really going to be talking about is if I've got a moisture analyzer that I'm using on process applications, how can I relatively easily validate that it's actually still alive and measuring moisture? And then it's reading, it seems like, in about the right ranges. So we're going to start, as I usually do, with a little bit of an over, over, overview of who Inside Analytical is. And then we're going to go into this sub subject of uh, moisture validation. So we're going to talk a little bit about you know, the history <coughs> of humidity measurements, why we want to verify analyzers and how we might do it for moisture analyzers. And then we're going to talk about a specific product that we've developed here at Insight Analytical, uh, which is a moisture generator. We're going to talk a little bit about its operating principles, its performance, and some of the ongoing developments we've got. So Insight is a Calgary-based, I should probably have manufacturer in there as well, manufacturer, systems integrator, and distributor. Um, we're in Western Canada. Of course, largely we service the Western Canadian market, but some of the products we work with, we, we sell uh, right across Canada and the US. We operate a 20,000 square foot uh, accessible facility space for uh, manufacturing. Got nine bay doors in the facility, a 10 ton overhead crane goes out one large store. So we can bring a full analyzer building straight into the shop off the back of a flatbed. Uh, for the Canadian guys, we're an AB83 compliant fabricator, which means we can fabricate systems that have Canadian res registration numbers. For my European colleagues, this is very similar in a lot of ways to the European pressure equipment directive. Canada requires that anything that's going to operate over 15 PSI continuously um, has a Canadian registration number, and each of the different provinces have them. So we've done CRN projects for Alberta, BC, Ontario, and Saskatchewan. Uh, a lot of the people here at Insight are people I've worked with for decades. Literally, I have two people in the company that I've worked with since 93, um, so 30 years now. Um, we bring a lot of experience from other manufacturers. A lot of us were XM and tech guys, some Yokogawa, et cetera. So we bring a lot of experience. We've got good documentation, drafting, design resources. Um, we're 100% focused on analytical. Uh, that's all we do. So we don't sell instrumentation like pressure, flow, et cetera. We are basically process analyzers and process sampling systems. Journeyman instrumentation and electrical, full factory acceptance tests here in Calgary. Um, as I mentioned, we do systems integration work. So I'll do anything from a custom sample system design to a process analyzer integration project, PLC and automation, right up to full analyzer buildings. Uh, 
we will work on projects. We like to get involved if we can at the feed stages. Uh, we like to help identify what might be the best analytical solution early on, go through detailed engineering and design, take that right out to fabrication, um, obviously commissioning and field commissioning and service is a big part of what we do. We run service out of uh, Grand Prairie, Calgary and Edmonton. And so we like to get out in the field and service the products that we sell. Um, some of you may know me from when I used to teach uh, with uh, the Swagelock folks and do analyzer sample systems webinars all, or seminars all over the world. So um, we like to believe that we're a really strong fabricator and designer for analyzer sample systems. We still do some teaching events. I'm doing some up in Grand Prairie in a couple of weeks from now. So we're gonna talk a little bit about measuring water vapor. And, um, you know, historically, societies have known the importance of water water vapor, humidity for a long time. I didn't put it on here, but even the Chinese back in the Shang Dynasty um, used to try to figure out how humid the air was by weighing a piece of coal. And if it was more humid, the coal would absorb some water vapor. Um, Aristotle uh, you know, wrote uh, anything that came out of the sky at, uh, for the ancient Greeks was considered meteor. And Meteorologica was a book about all the things that happened in the sky. And one of the things he talked about was humidity. Um, one of the early hygrometers uh, that was developed was by Da Vinci. It was actually, the concept was developed by someone before Da Vinci. Da Vinci was the first one to build it, but he basically took a piece of cotton and put it on a scale and had a balance there. And the heavier it got, it was more humid out because the cotton would absorb moisture. Uh, Frenchman, uh, I think he was French. He might have been Belgian. I know we've we've got Niels on here, so I'll give a a call on Belgian. I think I mean, might have been. I'm not sure. Anyways, Horace de Sousa invented the first hair hygrometer. So basically, you know, those of you who have curly hair probably know that hair changes when it's humid out, and hair expands and contracts with humidity. And so he basically built a hygrometer like the one we see over here. That as the hair contracted, it would turn the dial. And he found that blonde hairs were the best from this. Uh, his wife was blonde. And so many of uh, the early hair hygrometers were built from the hairs of his wife. So, you know, I mean, the, int the initial interest, a lot of the initial interest in, uh, in measuring moisture or water vapor was related to weather and humidity. You know, it's quickly recognized as like storms and all sorts of things, changes in humidity. Um, but now it's uh, many industrial processes. The measurement of water vapor is one of the most ubiquitous analyzer measurements we do. I mean, really the three most common species we measure are oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Probably are the three most common measurements that get done, certainly at least in the gas phase. Um, so. We see water vapor measurements being important in natural gas transmission, semiconductor fabrication, catalysis. Water is oftentimes a, uh, a, a potential chemical to attack catalysts. It'll affect re reaction self selectivity and catalyst life. In the petrochemical industry, we see it all through the cracking and reforming processes, everything from hydrogen production. Um, to uh, ethylene, propylene plants, et cetera. Um, it's important in battery production, uh, instrument air, any kind of dehy gas dehydration process, whether it's for CO2 pipelines, hydrogen pipelines, natural gas pipelines, et cetera. So like I say, a very ubiquitous and important measurement. We've ended up using a lot of different tools to measure water vapor, water content, water dew points. We've used everything from electrochemical cells like P2O5, electrolytic aluminum oxide cells, impedance cells based on ceramics like aluminum oxides or silicon oxides, capacitor polymers, um, chilled mirror type devices. You know, one of the most common things we see in the natural gas industry is of course, you know what it, it's, the manufacturer was almost referred to as the standard. I mean, every you measure water content with a chandler and you cool down a mirror and you look for it to condense on the mirror surface. 
dew point hygrometers. Quartz crystal microbalance has really got pushed by the technology really got developed a lot by DuPont, but there's a number of people who do them now. And of course, lots of people are putting out tunable dot laser devices to measure that water absorption band. The thing that's been difficult, or one of the things that's been difficult though, has been to find a good way to verify that the analyzer is performing. You know, almost all the other analyzers that we put out for gas phase measurements, certainly. We validate them regularly with a cylinder of calibration gas, whether it's a sulfur dioxide in a stack, whether it's H2S in a natural gas pipeline, whether it's uh, an oxygen analyzer at a vapor recovery unit, we'll run a calibration fluid on it and we'll verify that the analyzer is reading well. And so, you know, when we talk about analyzer verifications, we often talk about a number of different things, whether we're gonna look at linearity, which means we have to be able to verify it at a couple of different concentrations or places along the, the x-axis, if you like. We have our calibration standards here and we're gonna to wanna to see, well, what did they read? And then we can determine how linear the analyzer is. Um, we concern our things with accuracy, you know, how well we're right on the number we expect to be, precision, you know, are all of our numbers tightly uh, bound together? Are they spread out when we do repeated measurements? Um, and so calibration or validation is written into a lot of our uh, codes and procedures around how we use analyzers whether it's for emissions monitoring, whether it's for custody transfer and product quality specifications, it, it's, it, it's often written into the spec. The thing that's been difficult with moisture analyzers has been to find a good way to do that in the field. Um, from a process analyzer perspective, you know, we've always said, we shouldn't really just assume analytical accuracy. A lot of the tunable dial laser people have said, hey, the moisture measurement, or when you measure something from a, a unique absorption band, it's very close to a first principles measurement and you don't have to calibrate it. This is an argument that was made early on when TDLs were put out. And now a lot of people start to realize, well, actually the shape of the absorption band changes with temperature, with pressure, and it changes in background gases. So in fact, we perhaps do have to validate it. Also, it's been seen that some devices will drift off that absorption band and perhaps find another line that they're measuring. So not even measuring moisture anymore. Similarly, the chilled mirror people have said, hey, chilled mirror is a first principles measurement. We don't have to validate it. It is the validation measurement. Not a bad argument, except it relies on the temperature measurement being correct. And if you're using the dew point to go back to concentration, it requires on the temperature and the pressures to be measured correctly. And so again, we wanna be able to validate performance. Um, having a good idea, I mean, even if it's just a simple one point validation, it gives us an idea that is the analyzer actually performing. And that's kind of the reason I put this quote in from, from Grace Hopper that, you know, one accurate measurement can be worth a thousand opinions. A lot of people tell you, well, it's gotta be okay. Or you'll see the arguments the other way. If you don't have a way of validating analyzer performance, you'll get an art operator who says, no, I don't believe it. We can't have that high of a dew point. Analyzer must be wrong. Well, if I don't have a tool to try to settle that argument, I'm in a difficult position. So this is one of the reasons why we're saying that, you know, verify some way to verify and especially to field verify analytical performance. There's a lot of good laboratory tools, um, a lot of good dew point generators and things like that in the laboratory. We're gonna talk about those briefly, but in the field, it's a lot tougher. Oops, I'm gonna skip the slide. So you may say, well, why not just trust the analyzer? This is what a lot of people would argue. argue. Well, why don't we just believe the analyzer is right? We don't do that with any of our other analyzers. If you think about your installations for other types of analyzers, 
H2S analyzers, CO2 analyzers, NOx SO2 analyzers for SEMS, uh, any kind of process analyzer or emissions monitoring analyzer. We always try to get some data to be able to verify and validate its performance. The EPA has written it in for SEMS applications. If we do have some way of running a validation standard, we can identify things like drift that's occurring to changing baselines, which we might see in some analyzers because windows are getting dirty. Um, we might see changes in sensitivity over time, like we will see on something like an electrolytic or an aluminum oxide moisture sensor, maybe it's getting contaminated. Um, we'll be able to determine, was there an error in how this thing was calibrated? We may be able to use the validation standard to help us determine, do I actually have an issue with my sample system? Even if the analyzer is fine, if I've got an air leak, because ambient air, it's about 20 degrees C where I am right now. Ambient air has 2.3 volume percent of moisture in it. If I get a leak and I get a little bit of ambient air into my system, all of a sudden I can bias all my moisture measurements high. Contamination showing up in the analyzer, like we said, when we talked about changes in sensitivity, can coat sensors and bias results as well. And then we can have background effects like line broadening, a water vapor absorption line in a tunable diode laser device looks different in a helium background than it does in a carbon dioxide background. So we need a way to validate these devices. And performance validation may be required from legal and custody transfer uh, uh, requirements. So it's kind of strange right now, you know, in natural gas, we have a moisture standard for pipeline quality natural gas. Well, often the number that comes up in North America is seven pounds per million cubic feet. Um, but, and we put analyzers in, but we, if we don't have a way to validate those analyzers' performance, how do we know if we're really measuring them correctly and if we're actually on spec or not? Uh, we may have quality control metrics, again, for things like the semiconductor industry. Trace moisture can be really damaging for, semi, uh, for chips that we're fabricating. Um, Having those moisture measurements may help us to understand if we're going to be having corrosion or early catalyst failures, and that can help us do preventative maintenance or process optimizations. So there's a bit of a dilemma, though, because, like we said, there hasn't historically been a lot of really good ways to do field validations. There was a great paper written uh, uh, from uh, you know, GE Panometrics uh, back in 2017. Um, we're gonna actually email you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation from that because it goes through this subject of how do we validate field performance to moisture analyzers really, really well. Um, there's a number of reasons, like we said, to, to field validate. Um, when we put an analyzer in into an analyzer installation, it's often in a custom design sample system, custom shelter, and it's difficult to take the analyzer out and send it back to the factory for validation. This is especially true if we're using some of the larger, more complex analyzers, you know, things like a tunable diode laser or a dew point analyzer. You know, we know we put these analyzers in, I was when I teach a sample system course, I say nobody buys an analyzer because they really just felt like it that day. They buy analyzers because it adds some value to them and how they operate their process. And so there's gotta be a cost justification. If you put all this effort to put an analyzer in an analyzer building in, ensuring that it's actually work, working should be priceless to you. You want to have a way of validating performance. So the common approaches that people have looked at for field validation have been moisture calibration cylinders. Um, so we can buy a cylinder from a, a Scott or indeed one of the one of the specialty gas manufacturers uh, for moisture. Um, some analyzers have built permeation tubes into them 
or there are some vendors that will build a permeation tube type device. For those of you not familiar, a permeation tube is just usually a little tube of Teflon that in this case would be filled with liquid water and water, Teflon is semi-permeable. So water can permeate through the Teflon and come out on the other side. So we flow gas over the other side, picks up some water vapor and we can make that as a means to calibrate or validate analyzers. Or an alternative method has been to take a portable or a backup analyzer and bring it out and see if the two analyzers agree. Again, in the paper by, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get either of their names right, Gritz and Sparges, um, they talk about what some of the difficulties with uh, each of these methods is, and I've tried to just summarize those a bit. Um, moisture calibration cylinders, we can have problems with adsorption, desorption effects. These cylinders are often stainless steel or aluminum, and water likes to stick to the surfaces. So over time, their concentration can change. They're available at limited concentrations. So it's difficult because the cylinder is at high pressure. Um, you can only have so much water vapor in the gas phase at a given temperature. So they have to make sure that water is not going to condense in these cylinders. So they can only put a little bit of water vapor in there. They generally are only done in inert backgrounds. I should have added, they will do them in methane on here. Um, but you know, so you can usually get them in helium backgrounds or nitrogen or argon backgrounds, but it's difficult to get them in backgrounds like let's say carbon dioxide or chlorine or something that has corrosive or acidic properties to it. Um, so another device, yeah, you know, like we said, that can be used as permeation tubes. They are strongly temperature and flow rate dependent. Um, they generally only generate fairly low concentrations. So, you know, you see somebody like the Amatec in the 3050, they've done a really good job of, of implementing perm tubes in there. The 3050's perm tube is set to give them about 50 parts per million. Can't really, it's hard to generate a lot higher because it's hard to get high permeation rates. And if you do get high permeation rates, you quickly deplete the permeation tube of the, of the material inside of it. It's also hard to get this at high flow rates. So some of our devices, perm tubes tend to work really well in devices that need really low flow rates. One of the other options is to use a portable analyzer. And one of the issues that we can have there is, well, I'll actually start from the bottom, is, well, how do we know the portable analyzer was calibrated? What did we calibrate it against? It sat on the shelf for the last couple of months. How do we know it's reading white when we take it out? The other thing is if we leave the portable analyzer out and exposed to ambient air, like we said, ambient air has a lot of water vapor in it. So it can take a long time for the portable to dry down. We've seen this when we've tried to run portables and do water dew points. Um, you'll find that an analyzer that's been exposed to air you can hook up a cylinder of bone dry nitrogen to it and it'll read moisture for a long time as it tries to dry out all the moisture that has absorbed onto steel surfaces, into the regulators. Again, if there's polymers in there, they all absorb water vapor and they all have to degas. And then the question becomes, well, how did I integrate that portable analyzer into my sample system? So I know it's measuring the same gas my other, other analyzer is seeing, and is the tubing that I use there all dry? So there's a bunch of issues when we try to, a bunch of potential issues when we try to field validate portables. So when we talk about trying to generate moisture standards in the field, so if we're not gonna go to something that already has moisture standard in it, like a calibration cylinder, or already has water in it, like a perm tube. Um, if we had tried to bring it out in the field, well, we could bring the perm tube out in the field. But the other methods we can generate gas phase water standards, water vapor standards from liquid water is by injection methods. So we can use something like a syringe pump 
to inject a very small and known flow rate of liquid into a flowing gas stream. And if we make the assumption that all that water is gonna evaporate into that gas stream, we now know the mass or volumetric flow rate of the water, the mass or volumetric flow rate of the gas. And from those two things, we can estimate the water concentration. The, these have been used in the lab successfully. They're not all that portable and easy to drag out into the field. And again, when we talk about field validation, um, you know, these are often hazardous areas. So it might be a class one div two or class one div one, class one zone two, zone one in area. And so we have to bring out a, a, a device that's suitable for the area classification. If we go with perm tubes, they are really, really temperature dependent. So you have to, if you're using a permeation tube device, it's gonna take a long time to warm up, a long time to stabilize, and they also need to be calibrated. So if you're using a perm tube type device, commonly what is done, now again, some manufacturers do this at the factory and build the perm tube in, um, but if you're using a separate perm tube type device, when you put a new tube into it, what you'll do is measure the mass of the tube, run gas over it for a week or whatever at a constant temperature, measure the mass of the tube again, the mass change tells you how much water came out of the tube, and that tells you what the permeation rate is. And again, as we mentioned, these often only work well at low concentrations and low flow rates. Another method for generating gas phase standard from liquid standards is what's referred to as the diffusion method. And it's written up as part of a, an ISO standard. Um, I remember that I didn't write the number down and now I don't remember it. It's something dash eight. Um, and basically what it does is so I'm going to take the liquid, I'm going to take a run of tubing of narrow diameter tubing and expose it to the dry gas that's flowing back past it. The liquid that's in some temperature controlled vessel will get to its vapor pressure and it'll diffuse along the length of the tubing and mix in with the gas. And so we can use that as a method to generate uh, water vapor in a flowing gas stream. Again, it's generally only useful at low concentrations and relatively low flow rates, and it also needs calibration. So um, there's not a good first principles way to say, you know, if I use eight centimeters of tubing, and it's 1 16th inch diameter, and I connect it up to this permeate, the device that has the liquid, I'm gonna get a known permeation rate through it or diffusion rate through it, and I know what water content it's gonna create. I have to calibrate it somehow. A final method is what's known as the evaporation method. You basically take the liquid, bubble or allow gas to contact it, and if you know the temperature of the liquid, in principle, you know what its vapor pressure is gonna be. Like I said earlier, I know if it's 20, 20 degrees C here, the maximum, the water vapor pressure is 2.3 kPa. And so since I know one of the advantages of the evaporation method is in principle at least, and talk of that doesn't work perfectly, but in principle at least, it's almost a first principles type thing. We know what the vapor pressure of water vapor is at a given temperature. So from the pressure, I know how many molecules come off the surface of the water. And so from that and the total pressure in the system, I can calculate what my water content is. And there's a good paper from the International Journal of Chemist Chemical Engineering uh, by Lee and some of the colleagues on uh, test gas generation from should be a space in there, pure uh, liquids. And he talks about the accuracy of the different methods. And as you can see, none of the methods are extremely accurate. We're not talking about 1% accuracy with these measure methods. 
we're in this, you know, the best one that's shown here is kind of permeation at around two to 5%. And the evaporation method, it shows, as he mentions, can be difficult because we usually have to do dilution and the dilution rate is often the problematic piece. But they all overlap if you like. Injection is at best five, permeation gets up to about five, diffusion about five, and evaporation of five, all in the best, you know, in their best or worst cases, they kind of overlap in terms of their performance. Okay. So let's talk about a way that we can possibly do field va uh, validation using a type of a, a evaporation type device. And so we, when we started working on the design of this, there was a few things that we wanted to achieve. First of all, we wanted it small enough that it would be easily portable. An instrument guy can put it into his test kit, take it out in the field with him. We didn't want it to require any electrical components. It brings up that whole issue of electrical hazardous area, area classifications and how am I going to uh, make sure that I meet all those HASLOC requirements. And uh, it just became a, a simple way to do it is if, if we could do this as purely a mechanical type device. And again, if we go back to that, uh, that paper from GE Sensing Baker Hughes now, um, proper mechanism for field validating moisture analyzers. They had a really interesting paragraph in there. I've only put part of it in. I'm gonna talk about the last piece of that paragraph later. Um, there's a paragraph on one of the slides that says the ideal moisture generator could use any background gas as a carrier would allow one to dial in the moisture content they wanna generate and have fast response when within minutes be able to generate that gas at, at its outputs. So those were kind of the criteria. We sort of said, well, can we come up with a system that's gonna achieve that? So I wanna walk you through with how this works and give you an idea of how close we've come to achieving that. So again, you know, our issues are that we'd like to have a way of validating moisture analyzers. Cylinders can be heavy, large, difficult to transport. Um, this is one of the methods that's out there, but a lot of people don't like using them. Um, we want to realize that a lot of moisture analyzers will fail low. And so what we often want to be able to do is bump check to be able to go, well, if my alarm is set at seven pounds per million cubic feet, I'd like to run something close to seven pounds per million cubic feet, which is on the order of around 200 parts per million, and see that the analyzer reads about right. I really just need to see that the analyzer is alive and that it can actually, it changes when I change the moisture content. So like I said, what we've done is built a device that essentially uses the saturation method. We know the partial pressure of water if we know the temperature. If we know the partial pressure of the water and the total pressure in the system, so if I know the partial pressure in my saturator and I know the total pressure, I know what percent water I'm generating at the saturation side. If I take two streams with critical orifices and I use that, the dry stream goes through a molecular sieve to make sure it's nice and dry. And I mix those two together. I have a known dilution rate from the critical orifice, orifices. Well, is it orifices or orifici? We're gonna say orifices. Um, if I know the dilution rate, I know what water content I'm generating now. And like I said, we wanna make this portable and you can kind of get an idea from the picture there, but you know, there's, there's an entire moisture generator. Simple mechanical device, but two inch square by two inch square by, I call it 10 inches long, or five centimeters by five centimeters by 25 centimeters. Satur or desiccant dryer, pressure temperature, back pressure regulator, so we can actually do dew points as well.
So to give you an idea of how it works and kind of the math that one could go to if one was to approach this just from a first principles type analysis. Suppose I was coming in with some gas at 2000 kPa. Again, for my, uh, my American friends, 2000 kPa, 20 bar, about 300 pounds. I could regulate the pressure down to a known pressure that I read off the gauge. Let's say I regulate it down to 1000 kPa. I know the temperature that the saturator is at. It's at 20 degrees C. At 20 degrees C, the vapor pressure of water vapor of water is 2.3 kPa. So if I make sure I have enough contact time in there, um, I know that the gas that comes out of that saturator should contain 2.3 kPa of water vapor. If I put 2.3 kPa into 1,000 kPa of my diluent gas, I will end up at 0.23% or 2,300 ppm. So the gas coming out here of that saturator should be at 2,300 ppm. I have a critical orifice at the saturator and I have a critical orifice on the dry side. Let's say for every one unit of flow that goes through the critical orifice on the saturator side, 12 units of flow goes through the, uh, the dry side. I want to mention here, this separates this from devices that use mass flow controllers. If you're using mass flow controllers to, to control the dilution rate, the flow rate through the controllers is going to be changed when you change different uh, process fluids. The flow rate through a critical orifice, the amount of flow will change as you change the composition of the fluids, the ratio of the flow rates will stay the same. It's determined by the cross-sectional area of the orifice, the mass and the inlet pressure, the mass of the gas and the inlet pressure. But the, if you take, if you divide those two, mass and inlet pressure, since they're running at the same inlet pressures, mass and inlet, uh, inlet pressures cancel out. So we can just ratio the, basically the cross-sectional area of the flow uh, orifice I. And if we do that, it says that at the outlet of my moisture generator, in this case, I would be generating 170 ppm. Note that if I close this valve and only flow through this path, I can also generate a dry standard so I can check the zero of the analyzer. Also note that we have put a BPR on a back pressure regulator on here. So we can control the pressure at the outlet. For the orifice to be critical, the pressure at the outlet has to be at least two times less than the inlet pressure. So we like to run these things at elevated pressures, but now we can control the back pressure, which means that let's say for an analyzer like an Amatec 3050 that wants to run at 35 pounds, we could set that regulator to 35 pounds, meet its inlet pressure requirements. If we wanted to measure the, if we're using a dew point analyzer, we could set that back pressure regulator higher so we get a dew point that's within its range. So we need to know what the vapor pressure of water is at different temperatures. So again, you know what happens is, is as the temperature increases, more water molecules want to go to the gas phase. As the temperature decreases, water molecules from the gas phase would prefer to get into the liquid phase. So we get different vapor pressures at different temperatures. One of the common equations that is used to predict vapor pressure is called the Arden-Buck equation. And it's an empirical correlation that predicts the vapor pressure of water as a function of temperature. Only valid over there's a couple of two different equations, one over the uh, for over liquid water and one over ice. 
um, valid over a certain temperature and pressure range or temperature ranges. And so um, this is the Ardenbach equation for uh, temperatures greater than zero degrees C and I think less than 100 over liquid water. And so on this plot, we just went and got some experimental data that was on a ChemEng website, plotted on the graph, plotted the Ardenbach equation on top of it. And you can see that the Ardenbach equation does a pretty good job of predicting the water uh, vapor pressure as a function of the temperature. So it says, to know what the vapor pressure of water in the saturator is, all I really need to know is what temperature it's running at. That's what this gauge right here is telling me. So if we do that, the way we've commonly set these up right now has been to optimize the output range for what we'd want to measure in a natural gas stream. So as I mentioned before, the spec for natural gas is often about seven pounds per million cubic feet or about 150 ppm. Uh, from Greg on LinkedIn, there's a question about how do we know the temperature? The gauge is right here. The, uh, it's basically set to sit right on top of the uh, saturator. So this is where the saturator is inside the block and the gauge is right there. If we're gonna automate this, which we're looking at doing for a project right now, we would put an RTD in at that point. So I should mention too, the block looks like it's stainless steel, but if you see how easily I pick it up and what, how skinny my wrists are, you realize it's probably not stainless steel. It's a, um, a question about maximum operating pressures as well. So talk about that in a minute. Um, we make the block out of aluminum nickel plating it. So nickel plating will uh, minimize moisture absorption. Aluminum gives good, really good heat transfer. So the block wants to say isothermal. Um, can it work at higher pressures, 250 bar? Um, I'm gonna have to probably get back to you on that one. I'm not sure what the maximum pressure rating, I don't think so, because I don't know whether the, uh, right now we're using these NASI type regulators. Um, maximum inlet pressure, I think for those is 2,500 or 2,000 PSI. So it would really come down, conceptually it could work. The question would come down to what components can we use that meet all of those requirements. I don't think the components that are on it right now would meet 250 bar. So like I said, we've kind of tried to optimize this one to operate kind of in the zero to 200 PPM range, or because that covers the one that's the standard for natural gas pipelines. And one of the reasons we developed this product as one of our large clients is TransCanada Pipelines. And they specifically said, we have an issue with our moisture analyzers and how do we validate they're actually working. So as you can see at different operating temperatures at 20 degrees C, if you used, if you brought in, let's say 800 pound gas, you could get down as low as about 25 parts per million. If you ran it as low as 200 degrees, uh, 200 pounds, you get as high as about hundred parts per million. So, one of the interesting things with this methodology is that not only, like if I buy a calibration cylinder, the only thing I can do with that, if it's a 50 PPM cylinder, the only thing I can do is check the analyzer at one point. So in principle with this device, we can actually, like I said, run through the dryer, check the zero point, change the pressure on the regulator, so if my inlet gas was coming in at a thousand pounds, 
I could change my regulator set point to let's say 800 pounds, 600 pounds, 400 pounds. And if I was running at 20 degrees C, I would generate a range of concentrations that I could actually check to see, does the analyzer change linearly with pressure? It should actually, wait, well, sorry, it should change as one over the pressure. We are also limited right now by material compatibility. Like I said, we're using aluminum, nickel plated aluminum. So right now this block might not be suitable. For example, if someone said, I wanna measure moisture and corrosives. We'd have to look at picking an appropriate material like Hastoy, which we'd lose on some of the uh, heat transfer. Um, and so anyways, yeah, there's, there's things that, you know, so the ideal, from that GE paper was that we could use any background gas. And we've come pretty close to that. We can take a cylinder or process gas that's at sufficiently high pressure. We'd like it to be more than about 100 PSIG um, and is suitable with, for the materials that are used, the elastomers and the metals involved. And we can run any process gas. So we can run CO2 on this. We can run methane, we can run ethylene, we can run any gas that is compatible with the materials and use it to generate a moisture uh, validation concentration. So again, you know, one of the comments, what was in there was, when we dial in the moisture content, they wanna generate. And within minutes, the generator would be able to provide the gas at the, at the desired temperature and pressure. Let's discuss that for a minute. One would dial in the moisture content they want to generate. Now, what we do with the device right now is we provide you with a spreadsheet that basically says, I can put in my temperatures and pressures and it'll tell me what water content and what dew point I'm going to create. We are thinking about generating a cell phone app for that, but right now it's running out of, you can do it out of a spreadsheet or we can generate you these validation type charts. But well, let's say, for example, I knew my block was going to be running at 30 degrees C. I could run it at 80 pounds, and that's going to generate about 45 ppm. I could then run it at 500 pounds, and that's going to generate about 75 ppm. I could run it at 250 pounds, and that's going to generate about 140 ppm. So I'm able to generate within a limited range the moisture content that I would like to be able to use to validate the analyzer. I have to pick, I have to specify the generator to have a certain range that it can work over and then run it within the operational characteristics. Oops, sorry, I'm going backwards here. Run it within the operational characteristics that lets me generate those moisture concentrations. Keep on hitting a button and going back. Um, okay. So then the, the final part of that statement was within the minutes, the generator would be able to provide the gas to the analyzer. And so these charts are gonna show you the response time. We use a Tiger Optics Halo cavity ring down spectrometer to do the measurements. It was specifically calibrated for the background gas we were using, which at this time was nitrogen. I got a question in the chat. Okay, well, I got two questions in chat. The, both the opposite ends. How about zero to one PPM? Can we generate moisture in that range? I'm going to talk about low uh, concentration range, lower concentration ranges in a couple of slides from now. It comes down to changing the dilution ratio. If you wanted to do, uh, so then Marco uh, is asking about, what about doing percent levels of moisture? We could do that in theory. We'd have to run the block hotter, or you would not, you, what you would do is basically not dilute. So if you know the temperature of the block, if you know the blocks that, uh, 20 degrees C, um, you could generate 2.3% less the 
ratios of the pressure. So it's tough to get up probably over, over 5,000 ppm is probably gonna be pretty tough to do without running the block at fairly high temperatures. But percent levels, you can often, yeah, you would, I mean, I think I would just say, I'm just gonna take my gas at low pressure and bubble it through some liquid water at a known temperature. Um, okay, so let's you know, briefly talk about this chart. Um, so we're using a Tiger Optics Cavity Ring Down Spectrometer to measure the water content. And uh, the data points recorded, the little dots on this graph, these graphs are one minute apart. And so, um, let's see if I can get my thing to zoom this. Sorry, Justice, there we go. So you can see the little dots are about one minute apart. So I can go from you know 50 ppm up to 150 within about a minute, and it takes a little bit to stabilize. Um, when I then I can step it back down to whatever that is, about 90. And you can see it's about a one minute to do the step change. There's a little bit of a stabilization time that occurs. And the stabilization is different on the pressurizing upside versus the pressurizing downside. Because of where the flow restrictor is, when I increase the pressure on the regulator, it immediately changes the pressure in the saturation zone. If I turn the pressure regulator down and reduce the pressure, because there's a critical orifice in there, it takes some time for the pressure in the saturation zone to drop. So there's a little bit of difference in response time or hysteresis, if you like, on the way going up as compared to going down. Oh, this is my, my uh, we run a uh, AI program that is also following the meeting. So it should give you a little transcript of the meeting with key times for key questions and things like that. So just threw a message out in the chat. So you can kind of see the hysteresis a little bit more here um, where you, know, you can see it did the step change down then it took a little bit of time to stabilize on the way down. But again, that's you know 10 or 15 minutes, about eight minutes over on this one. Um, and you see the steps going back up again. And so we have reasonable repeatability from the way down to the way up. And you can see that we have fast response times. Um, I also tried to show on this bottom chart. Let me see if I can zoom that again. The process of getting back to zero. So, you know, we got up to about, I think it was about 250, close to two, between 250 and 300 parts per million. And then we said, okay, let's go back to zero now. And you can see that it quickly dropped back down, took a couple of minutes for it to get down to sub 10 ppm or so. If we look at the axes over here, took a couple of minutes to get sub 10 ppm. And then the last few ppm, it took a little bit of few ppm, took a little bit of time to tail away. But in general, I think we can say that the response to pressure changes are fast, that the system comes to equilibrium quite quickly, and that we basically see some step, like pretty much a step change response if we're just looking at validation. Does it read higher at 100 ppm than when the block set for, when the, if I set the moisture calibrator block for 100 ppm, does it read higher than it did at 50? It's gonna respond within a minute and tell you that, yep, it does. And then it'll stabilize up. And the repeatability is good over a period of time. This is a key point when we're talking about validations. What we want to be able to say, sorry, I'm running on, a little, running, I'll run a little bit late on this. What we want to be able to see if we're using this on a field analyzer is I want to know, is the analyzer running the same way it was running when it, last week? Because I know last week it was good. If it responds to the calibration about the same way or the validation about the same way, then I know the analyzer is probably still good. This is this whole idea of using control charts and SPC to say, does my analyzer working or does it need maintenance? Oops. Just accidentally 
doesn't give me a way out of this. Because I accidentally told me I would, so, so I want to shut down this PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna have to start it back up again. My apologies, it ju should just take a second. All right, should I be back? Um, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so then there was another part of that statement from the paper from Gene. So I wanna talk about that a little bit. This part of the statement was the accuracy would match the accuracy requirements of the analyzer in question. And that's why we want to separate the subject a little bit from validation versus calibration. Calibrations, we often want really high accuracy. And those are things that are often done in the lab. You know, when we're going to do a multi-point calibration, if you were to go and visit, I know uh, Greg's on here, if you were to go and visit spectra sensors, they, you, or Amatac, that you would see that they have an elaborate moisture generation device. They have chilled mirror hygrometers in there and they do very precise laboratory calibrations of their devices. So there's a question in the chat, so I'm just gonna see. Oh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, sorry, I'm running a bit late. You'll get a copy of the whole thing. Ben had to leave. Um, so what we wanna see when we're doing validations is, does the analyzer respond? Does the reading reasonable and is it repeatable? So we have a number of potential sources of error when we're doing this. We need to know the temperature accurately in order to estimate what the water vapor content from the um, saturator is. We need to know the pressure accurately to know what the pressure dilution factor is. And we need the dilution ratio between the two critical orifices to be accurate in order to determine the dilution due to flow. So we've set up a system where we can make estimates of how much error and moisture we'd have for different uh, errors in the pressure transducer and in the temperature measurement. So in this case, I've done it for, I can measure the pressure to within plus or minus 10 pounds. I can measure the temperature within, to within a quarter degree C. And if I was running this block and it, it's got a fixed dilution ratio of 17, the dilution is pretty repeatable. Once we know what the dilution factor for a block is, it's pretty repeatable with temperature. But again, the question is how accurately can you measure the gauges if you're using gauges? And so you can see that if we're measuring to within 10 pounds and a quarter degree C, at 45 ppm, we'd be about plus or minus two. At 75 ppm, we'd be about plus or minus three and a half. At 135 ppm, we'd be about plus or minus 11. So arguably someone would say, yeah, I don't think that's really good enough for me to say I'm gonna calibrate my moisture analyzer with it, but it does a decent job of validating whether it's still linear and whether it's able to measure different concentrations. And so from a validation perspective, I think this is sufficient for us to be able to do it. If we had work to do a worse job of measuring the temperature and the pressure, we have bigger errors. The errors basically double if I double the pressure and temperature errors. But even then, I'm gonna get a pretty good idea when I go from zero, you know, if I rent through the dryer, it doesn't matter, the temperature and pressure won't matter. So I'll know from zero, I've tried to go up to 45 ppm, and I'll read somewhere between 40 and 50. I tried to go to 75 ppm, probably read somewhere between 85 and 95. This is two standard deviations, by the way. So 95% of the time, you'll be within those ranges. Thanks, Marco. So there's a couple of other complications we're still working out. 
we said we base all of this kind of on this ideal case, ideal gas law. Well, they call it the ideal gas law for a reason. Real gases are an idea. There's compressibility effects. There also can be effects that different gases will cause water vapor to uh, evaporate more easily or not. It's called an enhancement factor. Um, and so we're doing some work in process on that. Oops, sorry, I switched slides. We have some work in progress to figure out you know, how important are these enhancement factors? If I look at some Bureau of Mines data versus the ideal gas law data and look at what's happening in the saturator, with methane, there's about 145 ppm difference from the data that we got from Bureau of Mines versus what the ideal gas law would say or the uh, water vapor equation of the state, Arden and Buck would say. So we have to figure out sort of how we're gonna handle with different gases. In principle, it all comes down to the thermodynamics of the gas. So once you've built a calibration curve for let's say CO2, it should be valid under all conditions after that for all the CO2 runs. But again, it's gonna be a bit more ongoing work. There was a question about doing lower concentrations. If you're gonna run the block at sort of nominal ambient type temperatures, 25 degrees C, 20 degrees C, if you ran it cooler, you can get about a factor at, at five degrees C, the vapor pressure of water is four times less than it is at 20 degrees C, for example. So you can get four times lower in concentration. But if we ran it at a common sort of ambient type temperature, 25 degrees C, but we changed the dilution ratio to be 100 instead of our typical, which is around 12 or 15, we could get down into a 5 to 20 ppm calibration range. So we're working on lower concentration versions of the calibrator. We have another project where someone's looking at asking us to do a automated version where we have temperature and pressure control of the block, PLC controlling it, and we can actually tell it, use it to say, I want you to output this concentration of water right now. And then the other is the option of looking at alternative materials. Some people have asked us about doing moisture and chlorine. Couple quickly, a couple of other innovations, just to give you an idea of kind of what we do. Along with doing, you know, selling process analyzers and full sample systems, we have a lot of manufactured products. So I'm just gonna give a few examples here. We do this little sample system block that you see over on the right here. Um, this is the complete sample system for a TDL analyzer, machined out of a single uh, substrate again. Um, pressure regulation and control, inlet calibration, uh, process gas uh, selection, relief valves, common drain from an integrated uh, membrane filtration system, um, all built into one block. Extremely fast response. People wanted this for shutdown analyzers for H2S and natural gas pipelines. We do some small quill probes, spherical tips to separate gases and liquids at the tip better. Um, very low internal volume and fast response. We'll build blocks that do complete uh, manifold systems for a complete analyzer installation. So if there's multiple analyzers, let's say there's gonna be an H2S analyzer, a moisture analyzer, a chromatograph, and an oxygen analyzer. We're gonna have multiple taps, multiple stages of pressure regulation, high pressure takeoffs for perhaps a dew point analyzer, and all fitted into minimal space requirements, integrated pressure uh, controls, and integrated uh, coalescing filters. Could it, uh, question about, can we certify it doing other reference equipment in NIST? Can I, would, because of the limits on the precision of the temperature and pressure, I don't know how well you would certify it against a NIST. I certainly could never see it being used in place of a NIST standard. Um, I would not, if they're looking for a NIST traceable moisture calibration, they're probably gonna to have to go to a dew point hygrometer like a MBW or a something like that. And I don't see that as a field device. 
Um, we do scoop probes, which are single entry return, uh, sample and return probes. They use the Bernoulli principle to drive flow up through the central uh, tubing, create an integrated fast loop that returns back to process with no process pumps. We've used this in both liquids and gas phase. On the natural gas sampling side, this can be very beneficial. We can build a fast loop that runs at high pressure and returns back to process. Sorry for keeping everybody a little bit late here. Um, this will go out with you. I just give you an idea of the product lines. We're going to have a couple of exciting announcements coming up about new product lines coming on board. So those will probably be out within the next couple of weeks. So keep your eyes open. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up. If you're going to would like to contact anybody, um, you can contact uh, certainly myself. Um, you can contact Juan or Robert. Both work in our sales and service group. Um, we have a lot of information up on the website. We're always adding more. And we're always putting stuff up on LinkedIn. So again, there's numbers of different ways to get a hold of us. And you, like I said, you will get an email with a copy of these slides with a couple of papers that I referenced um, and a link to the video of this presentation. So thanks everybody for coming. Sorry, I ran over. Always when I'm doing these the first time, it's hard to figure out the timing. Any questions, be happy to address them. And uh, if not, um, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Hey, Phil, this is Narge. Hey, Narge. I want to thank you for uh, referencing that paper from uh, that silly guy named Sparagis. My uh, wife married that guy. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, it was a great oh, paper. Pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, being with Panametrics for 30 something years has given me a lot of insight on on validation. I have to um, on, on moisture validation and I have to echo what you said. NIST is not required in these kinds of applications. Um, this is something that you're really just trying to go out there as a great tool to see if the analyzer is responding to moisture. And 99 percent of the time, that's more than plenty. Um, my only question is, if you're if you have a sensor that's uh, operating at line pressure and your device is operating at line pressure, then you're really only able to generate a zero gas and the and a, um, a single point cal gas, right? Because that's otherwise you have to take your pressure down in order to generate a different measurement. And the only way that would really work in validating another moisture point would be to bring um, your caliber or your validation device between your source gas and your sensor, right? So that the sensor also goes down in pressure, but then you're not operating at your normal line pressure again, but you are generating a different dew point or a different. Right. I guess the, the one opportunity you might have. Oh, hey, HP, nice to see you, Hans. Um, um, the one opportunity you might have is if the process wasn't that high a pressure, let's say the process was 300 PSI, then you could potentially use a calibration cylinder that ran at a higher pressure. Yep, got it. And no, use the back pressure regulator to control yourself back down to the 300 PSI. True and enough. now you could keep on validating the sensor at a couple of different concentrations. Um, but with a constant outlet pressure of 300 pounds. Good point. You could do that. That's great. No, thank you for that. That's uh, but if you're on a really high pressure, like if you're on, if you want to use actual process, our original idea was we wanted to be able to use process gas, you know, like the actual natural gas yeah. from the pipeline mm -hmm. and run it to a lower pressure sensor. But yeah, you're certainly correct. No, no, if we're, if we're validating a laser-based hygrometer, it's perfect yeah. because that's going to operate at zero PSIG anyway. So yes, you're yeah. using your, your pressurized gas. And the other question, I guess, is have you um, run into issues with using the MOLSIV um, in pipeline natural gas where you might have all kinds of stuff basically fouling it with time? I mean, what kind of lifetime do you see on the MOLSIV? We haven't because we're only using like the, you know, the, it really would come down to how often you're trying to do the zero with it, right? And like how often you're trying to do the validations. Um, on, and, and most of the applications we've done have been pipeline quality natural gas, which is generally pretty clean. 
Um, we did go to a 3A mold sale so it doesn't absorb H2S. Because um, again, we were worried that someone would open it and it's got absor adsorbed H2S on it. Um, so, I mean, we're thinking we should be able to get a year out of that mole set. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. This is intriguing. Okay. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. My pleasure. No, this was fun. Okay. Good. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, feel free to email me or call me. I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, you know, of where the, you think the, both where the opportunities might be and what you think some of the difficulties would be. Because again, you got a ton of experience. I worked with, um, I did a, did a training course over in England on sample systems. I had a bunch of the GE guys from uh, Ireland over. Lock Lloyd McNamara was there. Was oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's still Great with guy. us. Yeah, yeah, no, he's still with us. He's uh, he's running the application engineering team now. For the yeah, app. that's what I saw on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's awesome. No, great guy. Yeah. yeah. No, perfect. Thank you, Phil, so much. Yeah, thanks. Have a great day. Yep. Take care. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, hey, Randy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, the, the volume of the mole sieve, uh, certainly, of course, will affect the response time. But since it's on the dry gas side, it's not as big a deal. It's just a matter of purging that whole thing. I mean, it's, it should always be full of dry gas. But in an initial, when you're first starting to run, starting to running, you will have to, of course, uh, clear out anything that's been in there. We try to keep it isolated too, Dave, so that it doesn't uh, pick up moisture from ambient. It's the biggest thing that's going to kill that mole sieve fast is you leave the valves on it open. All right, thanks everybody.